Hi, William. Thanks for joining us. Uh, glad to be here. So do you want to just start off and just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you grew up and then how you got into filmmaking? Sure. Um, I'll try and keep it brief, but my name is William Schultz and I run a post-production studio called Speed Collective. We do a lot of automotive content, but we also do a lot of tech content, um, lifestyle content, furniture. We kind of do everything, right? So I grew up and got my start back in a very small town in Idaho called Shelley. At the time I was living there, I think the max population was about 4,200 people. So we're talking small town Idaho. I was pretty lucky to have grown up around cars. Uh, my dad had a 1968 Austin America. He used it for autocross, but he and my uncle built that up from a bunch of different bits and pieces of other Austin Americas. My uncle as well, he still actually runs and operates and races for Thunder Racing Engines. He's down there building thousand plus horsepower engines for drag cars and all throughout my early stages of life, I was surrounded by it. As I got into middle school and high school, I was the uh, board kid in a small town. And so what do you do in a, a small town like that? You skateboard, you bike, you get into sports. I was okay at that stuff. My friends were better. And so I chose to pick up a camera and film them. I think back then I was really experimenting with like what you could do with video. Um, so I was playing a, a, around a lot with like color correction and any effects in the effects tab. I was just dropping them in, layering them in, watching the computer go up in smoke and then doing it over and over again. So there were some interesting films that came out of that. Really, it helped develop my sense of uh, style and pacing even early on. I used all of that experience to get a job at a local news station there. So the town one up from us in Idaho Falls had a, a news station. It was run by a lot of high school kids. So I was doing that throughout high school, more or less working, you know, technically it was part time, but you know, I go to school from eight to three and then work from four till midnight or 1 a.m. every day of the week and I'd work the weekends as well. So it was a good experience. I learned a lot from a lot of different people there, made some great connections that still help me out to this day even. Um, so I turn 18, uh, just about turn 18. I'm graduating high school and I go, okay, there's one thing I'm pretty okay at and something I wanna go pursue. Uh, and that was video. At that point, I started looking around for schools and I found the Art Institute of Portland. Uh, so I signed a bunch of papers, got enrolled. This was 2007, so like the recession. Uh, it wasn't very easy to find a job at that point. Luckily, I had a buddy who I grew up with back in Idaho. He's working in you know, a, a small production house in Portland. And so I said, hey man, <laughs> Can you get me in? And he says, yeah, sure. Just come on by and meet everyone and, and hang out. And so I show up and I talk to the owner, Michael, and I say, oh, I worked at a news station. I'm in college for this right now. If you ever need a hand, let me know. I'd love to help out even part-time, full-time, whatever you need. And he says, all right, well, show up Monday. So I worked there in, in Portland. That was probably three or four years I was with them. Um, in my time with them, I was doing a lot more shooting. We're talking studio shoots, on location shoots. I'd have to travel for shoots. Um, and then I'd also do the editorial and motion graphics and, and you know a lot of that stuff. So it was a good place to learn. And again, at that point and with that crew, I made a lot of great connections that still benefit me and, and you know we work together. So yeah, when you were filming these like uh, projects with your friends at school, like the skateboarding and everything, what kind of films were you watching? Like when you're at home, like I'm, I'm sure you're watching like the four one one series or like some kind of Thrasher, like maybe YouTube. I don't know if YouTube was around back then. Yeah, so early on, the skate films I was watching was stuff I'd find on LimeWire and Napster. We didn't have YouTube back then. And so we did have some friends at the local Zoomy skate shop. Uh, the skate film, Yeah Right, uh, came out, and that was a Spike Jones uh, directed film. It came out, and I was blown away. You know, I got to see, you know, a skateboard film, but with like kind of all the creativity that was in my head that I just didn't really know how to reproduce at the time. Once I saw it and I was like, oh my God, there's people skateboarding with invisible skateboards. How'd they do it? And like the camera's moving too with it. And, and I was blown away by, by that kind of visual effects work. Um, and I tried to recreate it. I, I think I actually do have um, an old skate film on a DVD I can, I can rip for you. But um, 
I had to do it with a locked off camera, you know, on the Yeah Right film. They had a motion control rig that they were able to, you know, recreate the same camera movements. So I locked it off, had my buddy Ollie over, a, you know, like a milk crate. And I went in and rotoscoped out the skateboard frame by frame for that shot. And I was like, whoa, I did it. This is awesome. And and then from there, I tried to like keep doing and progressing and uh, never wound up at the yeah, right level. But <laughs> I'd like to think nowadays I could pull it off. <laughs> yeah, I, I seen like the, the new Inspire 3. They're able to do like motion traffic, motion tracking kind of stuff in the sky now. So it's. It's getting to the, the, the next level. But going back to like your early days, like with your friends um, watching skateboard uh, videos and stuff, was there other like kind of feature films that you kind of watched as well during that time period? You know, I wasn't ever as drawn into like feature films as I would assume most filmmakers are. I actually have kind of always appreciated like the short form contents, like commercials or, you know, like a skate film or something that was like easier for me to digest. And I think ultimately like easier for me to like kind of take and figure out how they do it and then for me to go do it. I worked at McGorm Video for three or four years. Um, and at that point, I felt the need to get into something a little more glamorous. <laughs> and so there was actually an ad agency down the road for me. They had posted a job listing. I saw it and I went, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to apply for it. I'm going to cobble together my best demo reel and I'm going to make a website and the director uh, had looked at my CV, which I made it five pages long. I designed out little bar graphs and stuff and made it really nice. And I guess I resonated with him um, as a creative. And so he, he saw I was hungry and saw I had some amount of talent and decided to hire me. How long did you work at that company for and what kind of like projects were you doing while you were there? About two years. It doesn't seem like a lot of time, but it was also a lot of time. Uh, at my time at Opus Creative, I worked on, I mean, a ton of projects. I was like their only video guy. Um, we had a creative director who was also a film director. He had a buddy who was a writer, so we'd use him for the writing. Um, and, you know, we had a couple contacts for DPs, but in the end, I actually wound up being the DP for quite a few um, kind of short form commercials. We actually got to do a, a job for Autodesk that involved a, uh, it's like an older Mustang that we rented. I also saw a helicopter. And so I got to do my first car rig on that thing. And it was super cool. You know, luckily I had some more experienced grips with me that had the gear and knew how to use the gear. But it was really fun for me to like get to at that time. That was the first time I got to combine automotive and filmmaking together into something that I was being paid for. Um, so that was really, really cool. During my time at Opus Creative, I was still in college. I was finishing up my last year in college. I actually graduated in 2011, and then I moved on from Opus Creative probably a couple months afterward. So yeah, I graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Art Institute of Portland um, with a focus, of course, in film and video. Um, that school is no longer around. I've never had an employer ask me whether or not I've been to school or has cared. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, I think school for something like film and video is helpful for somebody to make connections, but also for, you know, people who don't have much experience with it to like get their feet wet. Somebody like me who was, you know, constantly like ahead of the learning curve by like quite a bit, you know, the, the whole time I was in school, I was working full time for, you know, production houses and freelance and all that. So I was always way ahead of the curve. And thankfully, I had a few teachers who recognized that and they would set aside sort of a, a separate, you know, curriculum for me. Uh, you know, granted, I'm still in the same class as someone who's never touched Avid before. Meanwhile, I was, you know, working in Avid for years before that. So it, it was, you know, it was a very interesting experience from my point of view. Um, I, you know, if I could go back and do it all over again, I'm not sure that I would have. Um, you know, the, the cost and the, the burden of school like that, especially like a private, you know, for-profit school uh, was pretty detrimental. <laughs> um, it still is not super fun to pay that every month. But, um, you know, that said, I got a lot of great connections. I had a lot of great experiences. Um, that's hard to put a price on that. 
So what kind of cost is that? Like in terms of you get a student loan, is that how it works? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, me, you know, I I didn't come from wealth by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so I went to school entirely on student loans. Um, upon graduating, I had you know six figures of student loan debt. Uh, that I then had to deal with. At one point, you know, some of my loans were fifteen percent. Um, it was super predatory back then. I, I really hope it's not that way now. Um, it, it was not financially worth it to me. <laughs> yeah, I think like nowadays, a lot of the stuff you can learn on the job, like a lot of the stuff you learn in school, is kind of outdated or it might not be exactly. What you're after, like it's good to learn the theory of things, but sometimes you know you go on the job and it's like trying to think back to what you learned at school doesn't really apply. No, and there's never enough time when you're on the job to think back, like, oh, you know, what's a proper procedure for doing this, you know? And you don't have time. You know, once you're on the job, you're on the job, and you got to move, 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 so you can you know wrap on time and not go into OT and have a you know EP yell at you. So, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like you said, it's good to meet connections and kind of explore that area. But yeah, like advice for people, it's like you don't have to go to film school to succeed. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, especially nowadays, there's so many opportunities online to learn new things.、Um, I didn't have any of that back then. It just wasn't really around. So、um, I think you know, if I were in you know 18 year old William's shoes. I definitely would have learned most of everything online,、um, and for much less cost. <laughs> so, did you finish college and then find another job after that, or what was the time period? Yeah, so th there was a bit of overlap、uh, between the time I finished college and the time I moved to my next job.、Um, it was maybe a month or two. I still worked at Opus Creative, so I got the job at Mission Control, and this was back in you know late September of 2012. I show up that Monday morning, bright and early. It must have been 8 a.m. I showed up even a half hour earlier than than everyone else, even. And I put the key in the door. I unlock the door, open the door, and an alarm starts beeping. I go, "Oh God, no one ever told me the passcode for the <laughs> security system." And so I'm panicking. I, I'm like, "Well, maybe if I shut the door real quick." No, not a chance. I've already tripped the alarm. The alarm is going off. The police are starting to show up, and thankfully, one of my new coworkers shows up and he says, "Oh, did they not tell you the the code?" And he punches in the code, goes and talks to someone, and and that was my first you know few hours full time with them. I, I was bright red in the face and sweating bullets, and and you know had to gather myself for for the edit session that day. So、um, it, it was fun. <laughs> Says. Like that editing room, it's kind of like your setup now.、It、has like a couch behind you, and like, is there like liquor in the corner? <laughs> <laughs> That's usually under the desk.、Um, yeah, so you know, a typical post house.、Uh, they're set up very similar to my room. I would say my room is pretty unconventional because it's currently in my house. This is like the dining room of my house.、Um, but yes,、yeah, so、there's usually a couch. Sometimes there's you know another desk and some nice you know office chairs. There's always、um, you know a, a client monitor. So to my left here, which is our frame, I've got like a 42 inch OLED that's color calibrated. So occasionally I'll still have clients you know come to my house、uh, and dining room, and they'll sit on my couch and we'll do a color session live in person. And you know it's a lot more、um, comfortable for both of us. It's a lot quicker feedback. It's fun. It's a good bonding experience with like other creatives.、Um, it's a great time. I, I love having clients in the room with me. So. But then, like in terms of like editing remotely, you also do that as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, while I do love having clients here in person,、uh, frankly, after the pandemic, most people are too busy. They're also working from home.、Um, I've got a live streaming session that. Essentially, a client can log in. They'll see like the video output from my video card. So we'll do you know edit sessions, color sessions. We'll hop in, look at VFX.、Um, I do this with quite a few clients.、Um, there are of course another wide variety of jobs that we do where they're just completely unsupervised sessions.、Um, that's probably the the vast majority of what we're doing right now is this remote style editing. Cool. And then, so when you're at this post-production house, you did your first edit, and then after that, like, how long did you stay there for? Sure. So 
you know, after that first edit at uh, Mission Control, um, I worked there for about five years. It was probably five and a half years or so I worked there. Um, things were great. You know, I was a editor. I had a whole, you know, roster of clients that loved working with me. I could bring my dog into the studio with me. They'd serve, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner right to my desk. And it was a great time. Um, it was about that time I, you know, after, you know, that five year mark though, that I felt I wanted to do something more. Um, I'd been doing some stuff on the side of Mission Control, which was working with Tangent Vector out of New York City. Tangent Vector is a production company that does automotive content only. At the time they were um, doing the YouTube channel Drive, uh, which is now, you know, been sold and then purchased and now it's um, The Drive. Uh, and you can find them at thedrive.com. But early on, that was JF Musial and you know Tangent Vector creating all that content for for Drive on YouTube. And so I I had reached out you know roughly at five year point, and uh, I'd found one of their editors, their main editor online, and and I sent him an email. I said, Hey Will, his name is also Will, and I said, Hey Will, I love the work you guys are doing. If you ever need a hand, I'm a big like gearhead, and and I love doing this stuff. Um, hit me up like let me know i'd love to like even just edit with you guys and so will forwards that email to jf and jf replies i mean minutes later <laughs> this was all so quick jf replies and he says oh that's interesting we're gonna have to come up with a nickname for you we can't have two wills and i go oh okay well that's good you know that's great news okay yeah they, they want to work with me and so jf you know replies again he says do you have any automotive content you can share with me that you've done and i go well, not really, you know, I mean, I had the one thing I did for Opus Creative, but that was really just part of a bigger project. It was just, you know, slap a red epic on a car and drive around town and toss a couple shots in the in the edit. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you here in a couple of days. And so I actually wound up doing a spec keys for BMW with Alex Zanardi that turned out pretty nice. Um, and then I also did a, uh, a project for Jet Motors, which is a Mini Cooper company in Portland. Um, so they had a one of one Knightsbridge uh, Mini Cooper, which was here on a show and display uh, permit. And it was a very cool car. I, that was my first time like seeing like the, the classic Mini up close. And, and that one was super special. So I documented, you know, I, I showed up and shot with them for a couple weeks. You know, they ripped apart the engine, put on, you know, like a, a new uh, John Cooper Works kit on it. And everything was polished and beautiful. And they were a super clean crew and, and very organized. So, you know, shooting that was a walk in the park. And and uh, so I actually, you know, that was one of the first times I rigged up a car to car system. I had my BMW X5 and I put an A7S on the back of it with a, a cloud mount at the time and like a Ronin and it turned out great. And so I very quickly hurry, you know, edited that together, included that in my next email to JF and said, yeah, I've done a couple car things. Here you go. Check them out. And he says, hey, man, these are great, you know, and we've got a project for you. And and I say, OK, sweet, you know, and so I start doing um, uh, well, actually my first project with JF and, and everyone was for uh, drive on NBC Sports Network. Actually, they had at that point they were in on season three, I believe, and the episode was for autonomous driving. And the the segment, the very first segment I cut for them was the Alex Roy segment showing off autonomous driving at Thunder Hill. And so a hard drive shows up at my door, and it's just all this footage, no notes, no script, no anything. And I go, oh shit, this is a big job. And so. It took me probably a day or so to organize everything. I made notes based on Alex Roy's, you know, in-car commentary and then stand-ups. And I, I figured out kind of what the storyline should be. Uh, and I cut together, you know, what I thought was a, a great segment for it and uh, sent it off to JF and Tangent Vector. And they looked at it and said, we don't really have notes. This is great. And they said, you want more segments? And I say, oh my God, yes. I'm working on a, you know, a TV show on, you know, like the, the biggest, like, you know, automotive YouTube channel maker, you know, ever, right? Like at the time it was huge. And so I said, yeah, absolutely. Give me, give me more of this episode. I'd love to do more of this episode. And they say, well, we've got a different episode. And they gave me, uh, I believe it was season three, episode one, which was turbocharged future. 
um, and it was just showing off a bunch of different turbocharged vehicles and it was super awesome. Um, you know, I was editing footage, you know, with Chris Harris and Matt Farah and Mike Spinelli and Alex Roy, and I was just blown away by it. And uh, little did I know at the time that, you know, a year later, I'd be working full time with them. I'd be on the ground shooting with all these guys. Um, and that was, that was pretty life changing, that job. When you first got that, uh, the first episode, what kind of um, other kind of shows like did you have in the back of your mind or did you kind of do some research? Like did you watch like Top Gear or something like that? Or had you always been like into cars and like kind of looking at car content? I, you know, I did watch a lot of Top Gear prior to working with them. Uh, and that was a huge influence, of course, on them as well as on me. I mean, basically anyone that works in the automotive space, Top Gear was like pivotal to their ideas and thoughts and, and how we shoot cars. Luckily, I'd seen Drive on NBCSN season one. So I had a good idea of who the characters were and, and what their flow was and what they were trying to accomplish in their storytelling. So how much footage was there and then how long was like that segment, that first segment? Three, I want to say it was three cameras, a bunch of GoPros. Um, it was a one day shoot, luckily. Um, so, you know, it was probably all in all, you know, 18 to 20 hours worth of footage I had to scrub through and, and organize and figure out what was there, right? Um, from that 18 hours of footage, I whittled that down, you know, synced everything up, whittled it down to about a six or seven minute segment and then from there we had to you know of course cut down a little bit so it fit the runtime of of the overall show and then how long did they give you to to do that the general idea was like hey we need this turned around quickly uh we need to get it out to nbcsn so they can give us notes on the episode and so i said all right yeah, you know whatever i'm just gonna get this done as quick as i can that's been the theme of my career and that's also kind of why the company i you know started Time is time is money, I guess. Time is money, and the more jobs I can squeeze into a day, the more money I can make, and the more I can use that money to reinvest into the company or into myself to, to learn and grow, right? And I guess, like, whenever you get a first project, that is your test, you know? So they send you the hard drive, and they, they're like, let's see how he does. So the faster you can get it done, then the more impressed they're going to be. The quicker I can get it done, the better I look. Um, so I think I must have looked pretty good if they gave me another episode so quickly. Yeah, and the less questions you have, I guess the the more impressed they'll be. If you're constantly asking like, "What? Where's this? Where's that?" They're gonna be like, "Oh, this guy's a pain to work with." Exactly. End of the day, you know, a lot of the reoccurring work that editors get is because they're enjoyable to work with. You know, I've worked with, you know, personally, I've had to hire a few editors, um, and they do good work. But if they're a handful for me to manage, I'm less likely to work with them. And I've known that throughout my career. Um, and so it's it's something I always keep in mind on every project. So, Right. So, yeah, you did that first segment and then you'd go to the uh, post-production house during the day and edit your mayonnaise commercials. And then you were kind of thinking, oh, I want to get more into this automotive world or like, how did that progress? You said it took a year to become full time there. Actually, 2017, I left Mission Control. I moved to Austin. At that point, I was entirely freelance. Um, I was working with uh, Tangent Vector, you know, freelance. I, I'd say I was probably doing about the equivalent of like a part time job with them. And I was doing freelance for some other local places here in Austin. And I was doing fine. You know, financially, I was OK. Uh, creatively, I was pretty happy. I was, you know, working on a wide variety of projects, but I wanted to do more with them, right? You know, I mean, they were doing the cool stuff. They were, you know, filming, you know, stuff of Porsches, and I, and I, I was like, I want to be around that. I want to be at the track with you guys. I want to be over in Europe shooting a Porsche with you guys. And so I let JF know after, you know, I, I was freelance for probably two or three years, and and I, you know, flew to New York, uh, had dinner with JF. Um, JF and company. And after that, you know, JF and I took a, a short walk through, you know, New York after dinner. And, and I told him, I said, Hey man, I want to work full time with you guys. Like you're, you're a small outfit. I understand that. Um, budgets are probably pretty tight. You might not have, you know, the funds to hire me full time, but I, I would love to, you know, be a part of your team. Like, you know, he, he built out a fantastic team of creatives and that, that included full-time staff, uh, talent, 
freelancers. You know, he had great clients that were really fun to work with, and and I just wanted to be a bigger part of it. And so we talked, and you know, determined, hey, you know, we can make this work.、Uh, and so I joined them as a senior editor. Essentially, I was you know keeping track of all the projects. I was you know helping find new editors as we needed them. Uh, I, I myself was editing, you know, full time as well. So it was a really fun time.、Um, in addition to that, you know, I was flying all around the world at the time. You know, we were doing stuff for Drive on NBC Sports Network. We were doing a show called Proving Grounds. We shot that all all out at Chuckwalla.、Um, you know, flew to Europe. We'd shoot at Porsche. We'd shoot episodes of Drive.、Um, I got to go to Italy and shoot with Pina and Farina. Um, so I was doing a lot of really cool stuff. You know, we're talking, you know, on-site shooting, on-site editing.、Um, I come home and edit.、Um, it was a, it was a great time. I, I was, I had my dream job at that point. So, what kind of like cameras were you guys filming on, and like what kind of equipment were you editing on, at, like the software and all that? Tangent Vector, they were way ahead of the curve、uh, with like all the gear, right? Like their their techniques were great. I mean, they honed it over all the years of doing the YouTube channel Drive,、um, and so they had some pretty clever outfits, right? So for shooting car to car,、uh, they had two different options for that. You know, one option was you know literally we'd strap a tripod down the back of a minivan, toss open the the gate, and we'd shoot from that and do car to car like that. They also had a very clever system where JF had clipped the wings off of a DJI drone, and put a C stand, you know, arm and head through it, and then you know vacuum cupped it to the van, and and we'd you know remote operate this little DJI X5、um, from inside the van, shoot car to car that way. That was great because it let us get away with like a like some pretty you know high speed car to car maneuvers. But B, it was like so compact that no one noticed we were doing it. You know, if you have a big black arm hanging off of a, a you know a rig, people watch you and the cops you know look at you. And so you know having this very compact little system, we went unnoticed. I mean, we were shooting all over Europe. We'd shoot in New York. We'd shoot you know in LA, and no one would notice that you know we have a, a little camera strapped to a car and we're we're doing car to car and no one's bothering us. So. Was that the DJI Inspire Two or?、Uh, I want to say yeah. I, I think it was a DJI Inspire Two.、Um, I know that there was a lot of experimentation with all those.、Um, I think even nowadays they're still using the Inspire Two with like the X7 and like the ProRes module for it. So、um, it's still being put to use.、Uh, I think there was also another production company that caught on to this idea and did.、Uh, I believe it was like. One of those really high-speed films. It was either like Rimac or Bugatti had done a, a film around one of the test tracks. Yeah, as as Al Clark did the Bugatti one. I just interviewed him, and he he claims to be the first to do the Inspire、um, trick off the back. So we'll have to ask JF if he did it before him. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder, you know,、uh, because like you know, like I said, I'm pretty sure JF was doing that stuff even back in. Um, the early days of Drive, so yeah,、It's、super cool. <laughs> Interesting to get to the bottom of that one, <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure a lot of people had the same ideas when it comes to technology. They're like, oh, let's try this. And, yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's such a small like what we do is like such a small niche thing to do that we're all going to kind of see what each other is doing. We're going to borrow ideas and. And that's kind of how that just works.、Um, you know, competition is healthy, and it's a good thing to have in this industry. But you know, so is camaraderie. Like we're we all know each other. We're all trying to grow and do better things together. And and you know, if we're sharing some ideas and technology like that, why not? And then in terms of like the editing software that you you guys were using on Tangent, what what kind of、uh, software? So a Tangent Vector.、Um, And we were using Premiere Pro for everything. We weren't using any of the project sharing features that they offered at the time, but we were using Dropbox essentially to share assets, project files, exports.、Um, we were using Vimeo for reviews.、Um, it was pretty manual in that every night, you know, you had to go and back up each individual new file, your project files, everything to Dropbox.、Um, but it worked. It worked great. And then, in terms of like working with the tangent vector, what kind of、uh, timeframes would you guys have in terms of shooting a, like a TV episode, 
or a series? Would you do it all in one kind of chunk or would you do one at a time? Like what kind of time frames? Yeah, so at Tantrum Vector, we, we did a wide variety of content. So we would do some short form things, say for Porsche, and that would be, you know, like uh, the Back to the Future spot's a good one uh, to, to make use of, right? So they concepted and shot that um, probably in the span of about a month um, from, from start to uh, post. And then once it got to post, you know, that project itself, I think I had maybe a week and a half to two weeks to turn that around from start to finish. Um, we had to get it done in, in time for Back to the Future Day. Uh, so we had a hard deadline on that one. And, you know, with that hard deadline, you have to you have multiple deadlines before that for client review. Um, not only did Porsche have to sign off on it, but Electrify America had to sign off on it, as well as Michael J. Fox's agents and lawyers and everyone had to sign off on it um, because it used that Back to the Future IP. Um, so I had to get that, you know, turned around pretty quickly. Um, you know, I can definitely walk you through the, the timeline uh, later on with this and, and you'll see it's not as clean as most of my other timelines because frankly, I had to work so quickly and we had these, you know, very last minute changes that we had to accommodate, so. Cool. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Porsche projects that you worked on, like the Coca-Cola one? The biggest challenge with the Porsche and Coca-Cola spot was the transition from the old, you know, IMSA livery to the Coca-Cola livery, right? And so we had to, you know, they brought the car into a studio, they filmed it, you know, rolling up to the set and there's like an old, you know, glass bottle Coca-Cola machine, you know, dispenser right there. And the car rolls up, Pat Long gets out, you know, puts a quarter in, gets his Coke. And then as he's jumping back into the car, we had to figure out a way of, you know, getting from livery A to livery B. And they're very different. Luckily, you know, they had the camera on sticks and they locked it off. So car gets rolled in, a crew comes in and rewrap the whole car in, I don't know, the span of a couple hours or something. They didn't really film any of that, but car comes in, they swap the livery on the car. And then, uh, then we grab Pat Long, have him do that same motion again. And then I had to in post figure out how to make that transition. So I said, well, hey, it's Coca-Cola it's carbonated. Let's get some like carbonation bubbles involved. And so I layered in, you know, like I essentially all, all that that transition is, is like a vertical wipe with some bubbles and then, you know, a lot of rotoscopy and touch up work. Right. So it was fairly straightforward. The, the edit itself, um, turned out great. It's one of my favorite projects. Visually it's, it's stunning. I mean, they drive a Coca-Cola livery 911, you know, race car RSR in downtown Atlanta, like, literally in downtown <laughs> it was crazy so they did did they have that in mind when they were filming it no no <laughs> a lot a lot of the time you know these small flourishes and, and we can look at another project that, that that'll be especially true man um you know that's just kind of done by me you know something that i say hey you know sure we could do like a wipe or we could you know just do a hard cut or we could you know just figure out some transition to get between these two liveries but i was like i want to tie in coca-cola in a bigger way than just you know it's the livery on the car right so i was like let's get carbonation bubbles uh in the sound design uh i, I was a sound designer on that spot as well uh in the sound design i you know literally recorded with like a mic uh the sound of me opening a can of soda and then pouring it into a glass and you can hear like the glug 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 you know going into the glass and then the, the fizz and so i put that into the mix and it just sold it like it, it's so seamless and and you know really fun to watch and it also ties to the brand as well so yeah no that that's what kind of makes those kind of commercials memorable it's just like that little vfx or the little trick shots that make people think oh that's cool. And it sticks in the back of their mind, yeah. Mike's Peak on the Edge documentary. Um, this started out as a feature length film, essentially, and then we wound up splitting it into uh, Will Barber, who is another, you know, full time staff uh, and co owner of Tangent Vector. And he and I cut together, you know, we, we just basically pass off the edit to each other in like 12 hour shifts. And so, you know, he'd take a lot of the night edits. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, we'd flip schedules and I'd take night edits. Um, or I just pick away at it since theater, I got my raid, I grabbed like one monitor, my color calibration device and like 
a Jackery battery, you know, like a thousand watt hour battery, packed it all over to her place, you know, set up in her condo. She set up on her, you know, kitchen island. And I just, you know, finished up the post-production on that show from there. Um, well, don't realize when something like that happens, you have to kind of just keep pushing forward. And <laughs> There's no time off. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's like the running joke in my life too, is like, you know, everyone is always, you know, asking, Hey, where are you up to? And I go, Oh yeah, I'm working, you know, oh, I have to work late or, you know, it's, it's, you know, the most amount of time I've ever spent off is like the honeymoon I took, you know, it's like up until that, you know, it's like I get a weekend off maybe if I'm lucky and, you know, a day or two off here and there and a sick day maybe. Right. So, <laughs> you know, a once in a lifetime winter storm rolls around and I go, Oh, well, I'll make it work. <laughs> So you mentioned that uh, early on, like uh, JF said that you and William had the same name. So what did they end up nicknaming you? Oh, uh, yeah. So <laughs> basically, you know, Will would go by Will or he'd go by Barber. Um, and then for me, I was almost exclusively referred to as Schultz. Um, so on set, you know, on the radios, it was always, Hey Schultz, can you grab this? Or Hey Schultz, can you grab that? Um, no fun nicknames. And then did you finish with Tangent after that? Or like, where did you go? Going from Tangent Vector, I jumped headfirst into Speed Collective. I put all my time and energy and money into it. You know, I basically had, you know, some prospects for work and, you know, uh, one big job on the horizon. Problem is it was like, a net 120 payment and so you know it was gonna take four weeks to do this first job through speed collective and i wasn't gonna get paid for a few months and so i was panicking frankly uh, when i started the company luckily going all those years back all the way back to mcgorn video my buddy nick and rajon who now run mcgorn I reached out to them and said, Hey guys, I started a post house. I have no idea how to run a business. Can you a walk me through how to run a business and B do you have any work that I can do now and get paid for soon because I need to pay rent. <laughs> and they said, you know what? We got you or we're, we're good friends. We've worked together for, for a long time. They said, Hey, we're going to give you a retainer. Uh, I'll pay you literally today. Um, here's, you know, a few thousand dollars and then we'll, you know, you can work and we'll bill against that. And I said, okay, perfect. And so they saved my ass early on. And yeah, that's, that's kind of how I transitioned from, you know, Tangent Vector over to Speed Collective. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the Back to the Future project with Porsche that you did? Sure. So this project was produced by Tangent Vector and all the post-production was funneled through my company, Speed Collective. At the time, it was just me, so I was tasked with the edit, color, visual effects, sound design, and finishing for the project. In all, it took roughly a month from start to finish, which for a project of this size was really quite the challenge. Not only was I receiving feedback from Tangent Vector, I was also receiving feedback directly from Porsche, as well as Universal Pictures. Here in the finished timeline, you can see the layers of raw footage. Uh, you can see the colored footage, the visual effects layered on top. Uh, you can also see how much sound design went into this piece as well. We got the music from Universal. It's the actual track used in Back to the Future Part 2. Uh, the sounds that you hear throughout this are sourced from Porsche. We're blending together on location sound. Uh, we're also uh, pulling from other stock libraries for odds and ends, be it electrical noises or fire or whooshes or whatever else. In that same vein, we did another project, which I've got loaded up here, but this time it was for a company called Fastly. Fastly needed a, a short video to announce their new partnership with the Mercedes F1 team. And uh, they turned to an ad agency in Portland who knew me, uh, you know, from when I was living there all those years ago, they, you know, saw that I run a, a post house and it's automotive focused. And so they chose me. Uh, this was another really fun project that we took on over here at Speed Collective. Again, this one was, you know, edited in a very short amount of time. For this project, I did the editorial color finishing. I also did the primary sound design for the spot although the final mix was done out of house. 
getting to work on jobs like this is really what excites me and gets the gears turning for future projects. And is there any kind of goals that you have for the future that you want to achieve? Yeah. Um, yeah. So Speed Collective, I mean, we're, we're growing rapidly. Uh, it's, it's a very good thing to, to be seeing from my eyes as the owner of the business, of course. Um, what I would like to see in the near future would be a physical location. Uh, as I mentioned, I miss having clients in my office with me. Uh, I miss, you know, working closely with people, you know, me, myself, I don't get out on set anymore ever really, you know, everything's post for me now. Um, so it would be great to have a physical location, an office, you know, a studio space within Austin that's convenient for us and our clients to, you know, link up in and, and do good work together. So that's one of my immediate goals. Um, another goal, uh, is to expand our talent roster. Uh, we've got a bunch of great, um, freelancers, uh, some who I would like to see, you know, join us full time. Uh, and then, you know, also, you know, we like to diversify our client portfolio, of course, you know, we're always looking for, you know, the, the next great project to work on with someone. And lastly, do you have any advice for filmmakers who want to get into editing and maybe specifically editing car content? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I would impart on someone looking to get into doing what we do is, you know, be original, um, put in the work. Just, just build up your, your pool of people that you trust and want to work with. Um, I, I also say like, don't be afraid to reach out. I got the job at Tangent Vector because I reached out to Will Barber and said, Hey, I love your work. Can I work with you someday? And he made it happen. It's, it's always worth just reaching out to someone, even if you don't know them. So, well, thanks so much for joining us, William. It was a great, uh, insight into being an editor and uh, how you got there and hopefully people can take this as a lesson and hopefully use it to get to their own you know career as an editor one day